I want to welcome you again to Cross Community Church. Uh, whether you're here uh, in our mass service, whether you're watching us online, we're grateful that you've chosen to, to worship alongside of us today. Uh, a question that comes very often when people would come to a belief in God, and, and this could be a belief in any God. We believe there is one true God. All the others would be false. But even people who don't believe in our God, the question that ultimately comes up for almost any of us is, what does God require of me? Like, if we believe there is a, a creator God out there uh, who is, is the, kind of sovereign over all of the earth, what does he want from me? Like, how do I know that I'm in good with God? Like, what does God require of me? And, and when you start to answer that question, some people, uh, they go down the road of legalism. And so they're looking at the law, they're looking at everything they can read in the Bible, and they're doing their, their dead level best to try to obey everything that's written in the scriptures. And uh, if you've ever tried that, by the way, you fail a lot, right? There's no way you can live up to the law. And so then we have this relationship with God where uh, you're, you're kind of shame-based, like, I hope God's not mad at me, maybe I can be a little better tomorrow and God will be pleased with me. Now, the other side of that, uh, what does the Lord require me? It, you, you look to God and you think, you know, really God doesn't require anything. He's just all love and grace, and I'm not really worried about what God would want. And you just kind of go and do your own thing. That's called license. Now, uh, if you were with us last week, you know that Paul, in kind of setting this straight for us, he called on the, the believers in Philippi to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. When you, If you want to know what God requires of you or how it works in terms of Christianity, living, how do we know to how we should live before God? Um, it's this. As believers in Jesus Christ, as Christians, we respond to what we have already received. Okay, I want to say that again. As believers in Jesus Christ, the way we relate toward God, the reason we obey God, what we, you know, what we do and don't do, it is response to what we have already received. So Paul, last week he says, now conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, if you don't know the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is this, that we are sinners separated from God. But because of the work of Jesus Christ, because Jesus came and lived a perfect, sinless life, because he went to the cross and died there on our behalf, um, he then credited that righteousness to us so that we can be reconciled to God. Just so you know, that happened 2,000 years ago. The work of Jesus Christ on your behalf, the good news of the gospel, that work of the cross was accomplished 2,000 years ago. It had nothing to do with what you do or don't do. It has everything to do with the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. And so Paul didn't say, hey, conduct yourselves really well so that you might receive the gospel. Hey, live really good lives so that you might earn salvation. That's not what he says at all. He says, now I want you to conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is responding to what we have already received. Because Jesus did something for us. We out of gratitude, out of obedience, out of a love for God now, then respond by following the way that Jesus would have us to live. Now, that, that's where Paul was last week, and he was instructing the church of, here's how you respond in the midst of opposition. You stand firm, united in one spirit, like striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's what you do in the midst of opposition. That's how believers should respond to the gospel that we've received in the midst of opposition. Now, this week, he's going to continue his thought, and he's going to teach us about how we should live our lives. So people that may not be opposing us, uh, how we live our lives with, together with the church, how we live our lives with people who are just out in the world, with our coworkers, with our classmates, the people that we encounter, our neighbors, even the pesky ones, right? Like, this is how we're supposed to live with everybody else, not the people who are just coming against us, but the rest of the world. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse one. And he begins with the word, therefore. Again, linking this to what he's already told us. Live lives worthy of the gospel which you have received. Lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's going to remind us now of what we have received in Christ Jesus, of what we're ultimately going to be responding to. He says, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ. I want you to imagine um, you had been sentenced to... Um, to life in prison. You'd committed the crime, you went through the whole trial, you hired the attorney, you were convicted of the crime, and you were guilty. 
But somebody came along and worked on your behalf to secure your release from prison that you could go uh, live no longer burdened by the consequences of your sin, but you get to live a life free in the world. Would you be encouraged, like having sat in a cell knowing this is the rest of my life, like this is what I have to live in, um, and then you got set free, you would likely be encouraged, right? The gospel is even greater. It wasn't a lifetime. It was an eternity, right, spent separated from God in a place called hell. And so Paul is kind of asking, well, he's asking a rhetorical question almost. He's doing an, an if, if there's any encouragement from Christ. Of course there's encouragement in Christ. Look what he's done for us. He's reminding us of the benefits of the gospel. This is what you've received. If any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of his love, that selfless divine love which loves us even when we sin, even when we rebel, even when we turn away. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, he's like, remember what you've received? Do you remember what God has done for you, the benefits of the gospel in your life? And then he's going to give us a then. He says, now make my joy complete. Now again, he's speaking to the church of Philippi. And these are things they're supposed to be united in doing. He's going to mirror some of the language he he used uh, in the prior part of the letter here. He says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Maintaining the same mind. Love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. What you should see here is a profound picture of unity. Now, that may sound like absolute, absolutely impossible in the culture in which we live. Like, if you scroll through social media, Facebook, whatever it is that you would use, a unity is not the picture that we get. As a matter of fact, what we find are all the little distinctions we have. Like, I love this politician, and that person loves that politician, or this policy, or maybe I'm a part of this party, or another party, and, and, and I tell you what, I, I like this kind of food, and you don't. It, we post all sorts of stuff that highlights our distinctions. And yet what Paul has done here is said with the church of Jesus Christ, cross community church a couple thousand years later, we should have the same mind, the same love. The the word here where it says, uh, the word used for maintaining, uh, I'm sorry, united in spirit, it's actually just two Greek words sandwiched together, which means souls together. And so you're of one mind, the same mind, the same love. Your souls together, you're united completely as the body of Christ, intent on one purpose. Now, if we're going to have the same mind, the same love, our souls united together in one purpose, the truth of it is that mind, that love, that purpose has got to be greater than any individual purpose that we're going to serve. It's not as if somehow our distinctions are going to disappear. Uh, If you're a Democrat, you're probably not walking away from that. If you're a Republican, you're probably not about to give that up. If you're one of those proud independents, you're probably still going to be a proud independent, right? I mean, whatever your distinctions that, that exist in this life, you're probably not going to give that up. And so if we're going to unite, we're going to unite around something that is greater. And Paul's going to tell us what that is. When he says here, uh, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, he's, he's using a Greek word that's used multiple times throughout this passage. It's the same word he uses in, in verse 5 when he says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ. If you want to know what mind you're supposed to have, how you're supposed to think, what your mindset is supposed to be, if you want to know what that love is that we're supposed to unite around, all of us thinking similarly, loving similar, similarly, pursuing similar things, that mind, that love, that pursuit is found in the person of Jesus Christ. And so Paul's like, hey, you want to know what that is? I'll tell you, glad you asked, right? Verse 5, he says, have this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, who although he predated creation, who although he's sovereign over every single detail that happens in every single place, like every single moment, all at the same time, God's sovereign over every single thing. He is the one true God who spoke all that we know and see into existence. That 
God. You should have his mind. Because that great, big, powerful, worthy God, worthy of all glory and honor and praise and worship and everything we could give him, here's what he did. Here's how he thought about himself. Here's how he responded to the world. Here was his mind. Here was his love. Here was his purpose. He existed in the form of God, but he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't regard existing as God something that he had to cling to. But instead, he emptied himself. Taking the form of a king, no, a ruler, a president, nobility, super rich, no. Our great God, worthy of all glory and honor and praise, sovereign over the whole world, like the one true God, took the form, he emptied himself and took the form of the lowest servant. The bondservant. And being made in the likeness of men. God took on flesh. Can you imagine being God? He's omnipresent, so he's everywhere all at the same time. He was all-knowing. He knew everything. He was all-powerful. He could do anything he wanted to do. I mean, he spoke our world into existence. He just spoke it, right? In the person of Jesus... God took on flesh with the weaknesses and frustrations that come with human flesh. Y'all, I'm 40, and I already feel it, right? I wish that my body would still respond like it did when I was 20. Y'all, I'm going to be honest with you. I got a sore knee today. I stepped a little wrong in the shower. You know what I mean? Kind of that little slip thing. And my knee hasn't been the same for like two weeks. It's like swollen and sore. Like the weaknesses and the frustrations of the flesh. The God who was sovereign over all. He's omnipresent. He knew all. He was all powerful. He could do anything. He took on the constraints of human flesh. But he didn't stop there. The God who became a bond servant. He took on flesh. Being found in the appearance as a man in verse 8. He humbled himself beyond just human flesh. He became obedient to the point of death. He was willing to die, and not just any death. He was willing to endure a death on a cross. The most brutal form of punishment and execution, Jesus endured for us. You want to know an appropriate response to the gospel? You want to know how we should respond if we've been encouraged by Christ, if we've received benefits as a result of the work of Christ for us? You know the appropriate response? is to take on that mind, that attitude, that love, that perspective with our own lives, that we would live this out, live as Christ. The word Christian came as a result of early Christians, early believers in Jesus Christ, who their lives looked like Jesus. And people were like, hey, that's a little Christ. That's a Christian. That's someone who lives their life as Jesus lived his life. That's someone who's taken on the attributes, the mind of Christ, the love of Christ, the purpose of Christ. What does God require of you? Listen, the gospel cost him everything. Death on a cross. God sacrificed his son for you, but it's free to us. However, what we do in response to the gospel, we respond to what we've received and we obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul's like, hey, church, here's how you respond in the midst of opposition. Standing firm, one spirit, like striving together for faith the gospel. And then the rest of the time, man, you need to have this mind of Christ. And this isn't like a one-time deal. Y'all, y'all ever do this where you got to like psych yourself up to do the right thing? Maybe it's like the family member that's kind of frustrating to me and to you and you know they're coming for a holiday and you're like, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to get mad. I'm just ready to endure it. They're going to try to provoke me and it ain't going to happen, right? And so you kind of psych yourself up for these few hours you're going to be with this person and you're like, I'm not going to lose it. Right? That's not the sort of thing that Paul's talking about. He's saying your lifestyle 
your day-to-day walk, the mind that you take on, the love that you take on, the purpose that you take on is the mind, the love, and the purpose of Jesus Christ. And here's how he lived. He humbled himself and became the servant of all. If you want to know how far his obedience took him, it took him to the point of death on the cross. There is no end to which we should be unwilling to go in service, in humbling ourselves to our fellow man. What does it look like for us to live lives worthy of the gospel? We look back to what we've received. We look back to what Jesus Christ did for us, and we respond to that. Have this attitude, this mind, this mindset, this way of thinking in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself to the, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Are you following Jesus? If Jesus said, hey, hey, this is the way, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Are you following, are you walking in the way of Jesus Christ? Do you see that humbling yourself and becoming a servant is actually where true life lies? Like walking with Jesus, living as Christ, that's where we find the abundance. It's not in more possessions, it's not in being served, it's not in gaining status. It's in, actually it's in laying our lives down one for another that we find true life in Him. Paul goes on to explain a little more in verse 3. If you want to know, like, what might hinder this in the church, if you want to know what might cause problems for us and kind of disrupt this unity that we're supposed to have, we're supposed to be souls together, one mind, one love, one purpose, souls together in that. You want to know what disrupts that unity? You want to know what brings destruction in the church? You want to know why so many people say, yeah, listen, I tried to church, I tried church one time. And man, the people there, they treat me terribly. Let me tell you about the story about why I don't go to church anymore. Paul's like, Here, here's what happened. Here's the problem. In verse 3, he says, do nothing. In the Greek, this word for nothing, it means nothing. Not one thing. Do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit. This word selfishness that, you know, we read and maybe don't understand all of what Paul's talking about. It's the Greek word eretheia. It means self-seeking. It's looking out for your own interest. It's really experiencing the world through the lens of you and choosing to pursue that which is best for you. Now, that's how some people choose a church, right? And that, like, many people are like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to check it out. Uh, the people that greet me well, they got the best coffee, the best music, the best preacher. He's short, thank goodness. Like, that's how we generally experience the world. Like, I'm going to pursue what is best for me. If you want to know what's wrong with our world, our politics, the whole bit, it's people are like, hey, I care about me above other people. Paul's like, do nothing out of that mindset. Do nothing from that attitude, from that perspective, not One thing, you who have received the benefits of the gospel, who saw the work of Jesus Christ for you, who was God, he was worthy of all glory and honor and praise, he served you, not an ounce of selfishness, but was completely selfless in laying down his life for you. Do nothing from selfishness. He goes on, nothing from selfishness or empty Conceit. This is the Greek word, kinodoxia. It's vain glory or empty pride. This is thinking more of ourselves than what we ought to. This was uh, me. I uh, played a game of basketball with my 12-year-old son yesterday. He had a, a basketball game. We come home, and he's like, hey, Dad, you want to come play with me a little bit? You know. And so uh, I am 40 years old. He's 12 years old. I'm taller than he is. I'm bigger than he is. I'm stronger than he is. And so we played a game of horse, and I was talking trash, right? That is totally empty conceit. It's vain pride because I got nothing, y'all. I, I'm just like I can still beat my 12-year-old son. It's silly. Silliness. 
Because to be honest with you, I'm a horrible basketball player. Like, my coach was glad when I quit in the sixth grade, okay? He was like, hey, good, you should go wrestle. That's more suited towards you. I'm no good at all. And the truth of it is, for us, apart from what we've received in Jesus Christ, there is no good thing in us. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And yet sometimes we come gathering with the body, we go to our workplaces, maybe it's in our home, and we start to think more highly of ourselves than we should. We think, you know what, I deserve this. I've earned my place here. People should take care of me. People should serve me. People should give me respect. People should treat me accordingly. Jesus said not, or Paul said, not one thing from selfishness or empty conceit. Don't think more highly of yourselves than you should. Can I ask you a question? How do you see yourself? If you go out in the community and you act with people, do people owe you something? Do you think people owe you respect? Do you think people owe you a certain kind of treatment? Do you expect people to serve you and take care of you? And oftentimes, most of us, by the way, would say, oh, absolutely not. But then look at how you respond when things don't go the way you want them to. How do you respond when people don't move out of the daggum school drop-off line like they should? Like, seriously, did you not know that we've been waiting in line for half a mile, that your kid was going to get out, and now you're sitting here, you're having a conversation? Like, what are you doing? And I get frustrated. I think, they owe me. I'm what's central here, and they should get out of my way. Or maybe for you, it's a long line at the grocery store, the referee that doesn't make a call the way you think he should. Like the, the whole story, what ends up happening is we start to think more of ourselves than we should. We start to view ourselves as a center, and the world ought to serve us. Jesus says, not one thing. Selfishness or empty conceit. He goes on, but with humility of mind. Regard one another as more important than yourself. Looking ahead in the drop-off line and thinking, I have no idea what that lady went through with her kids this morning. And it's my privilege to wait on her. She's more important. It's the coworker who might frustrate you day in and day out. And you would say, he's more important and so we humbly submit ourselves to them. We humbly serve them. We continue to care for them. We continue to live as Christ on their behalf. Again, we got to look back over and over and over to what we have received. Because some of us were kind of cantankerous, right? A little hard to deal with, right? Many of us persisted in our sin. We rebelled against Christ. We've been disrespectful to him. Like, we've done all manner of things to Christ. And yet, he laid down his life for us. You've done worse things to Christ than anyone has ever done to you. But Paul's like, hey, as a result of the gospel, remember what Jesus has done for you. Lay down your life as Jesus did. Nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but instead consider others as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. You should be interested in the things that interest others. More uh, specifically, you should be concerned about the things that concern other people. Now, here's the thing. Jesus was good, right? He was in heaven ruling and reigning with God. I don't know exactly what that's like, uh, but he was like in perfection, like angels singing praises all day, every day. He had perfection. But... He loved us, and he was concerned about the things that concern us. So Jesus stepped down out of the perfection of heaven into this broken world where he would be beaten and abused and mocked and spat upon, stretched out, the nails driven through his wrists and his ankles. He hung there on the cross gasping for breath because he was concerned about the things that concern us. 
we were separated from God and Jesus entered into our brokenness. Jesus entered into this world on our behalf to be concerned about the things that others are concerned about, interest in the interest, or interested in the interests of others. That means we put ourselves in the place of other people and we care for them as we would want to be cared for. You may have everything you need. The brokenness of our flesh is going to say we need more. It's not going to look to the need of our neighbor. It's not going to look to the needs of our friends. It's going to say, I want more. Paul says, not one thing from selfishness or empty conceit. But instead, you look to the interest of others, not merely yourselves. Like, we know our needs, right? Like, when I'm hungry, I'm not surprised. Like, I'm not like, oh, I'm not sure what's going on. I know I'm hungry. I feel it. Paul's saying you should feel it on behalf of other people. You ought to enter into their need. You ought to care about the things that they care about. When it comes time to go school shopping, we're concerned for the things that concern other people. And so we don't just take care of me and mine, right? We live as Christ. We provide clothes for kids that don't otherwise have clothes. And we might even have to tell our kids no a few times in order to pay for that, right? When it comes time to pay the bills every month, we don't just care about what concerns us. We care about the concerns of people who who might need a little help to take care of their bills. When it comes time to love our kid and like pursue their future and help them to be successful because we all want that for our kids, we care about that not just for us, but we care about that for other people. How do we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel that we have received, the gospel of Jesus? We respond to that which we've received. Jesus gave his life for us. We can give stuff to other people. We can serve them. We can care for them. We can offer ourselves to them. We can humble ourselves and even endure suffering on their behalf. Now, here's the good news. You may not see it. You may not feel it. But that is where true life is found. Look look what God did in verse 9 talking about the obedience of Christ, how he humbled himself. He became the bondservant, obedient even to death on a cross. For this reason also. See what Jesus did? For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, to the the sovereign who became a servant. God set him above all other things, gave him the name above every name, that every knee would bow, every tongue would confess. Now, uh, you're never going to get that name. Only Jesus gets that, right? He is Lord. He was God in the flesh. But you know what happens for us? When we humble ourselves and serve one another, this is out of 1 Peter um, chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Peter says, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. God is opposed to the proud. Empty conceit, vain pride, God is opposed to to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It says, therefore, humble your, yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. When we humble ourselves, we serve one another. We don't think more highly. We don't live out of selfishness, but we care about the interest of others, deem others more important than ourselves. Do you know what we can look forward to? God will exalt us. Jesus said, Hey, you want to be great in the kingdom of God? Become a servant. You want God to exalt you? Humble yourself. I heard a pastor say one time that if we take God's job and exalt ourselves, then he'll take over our job and he will humble us. Now, the good news here is that if we respond to the example of Jesus Christ, living lives worthy of the gospel, Christians in 2021, where we are called to live as Christ, in this place, in this time, like these moments in our uh, current conditions, our nation in the midst of a pandemic, if we will choose to live as Christ, take on the mind of Christ, the love of Christ, pursuing the purpose of Christ, giving ourselves up on behalf of other people, the scriptures tell us that God will 
exalt us. Now, I don't know what that looks like. I'm not promising he's going to make you rich. He probably won't. And if he did and you had the mind of Christ, you'd give it away, right? I mean, I'm not saying he's going to make you healthy because I don't know what God's got in your path. But at the end of the day, no matter what path he calls us to walk, we want to humbly serve one another. And the whole church should be unified in that. Can you imagine a body of five or six or 700 people who all lived like Jesus lived, giving ourselves up for each other, offering ourselves in service to one another, giving and caring for one another? Do you wish our politicians would do that? Man, think about how different our country would be. You know what Jesus says? To those of you who have received the gospel, you go first. Start serving people in your workplace. Start serving people at your school, in your home. Giving yourselves up one for another. Just two things I want to encourage you guys to do. Um, as a practical application for how we could live this out, having the mind of Christ, the love of Christ, living with the same purpose that Jesus lived with in response to what he's done for us. I want to encourage you guys, number one, is to begin to serve faithfully. Begin to serve faithfully. This means day in and day out, serving one another. It ought to be the normal pattern of your life that wherever you show up, there is a bond servant. That whatever environment you find yourself in, there happens to be a bond servant there. Someone who's willing to obey Christ, not till it gets uncomfortable, not till it starts to cost you, but someone who is willing to obey Christ even unto death. That we would follow him even there. And so we just start serving faithfully. That's going to happen in this church. It ought to. We're the body of many parts. We all need each other. And it ought to happen when we kind of break hands and we go back out into the world. We serve one another faithfully. People ought to look at us and think, why in the world would she serve me? I know how I've treated her. I know I've talked about her. Why in the world would he serve me in that? Why would he give to me? I've given them nothing but grief. And they begin to see Christ in us. I don't know if you know this, this week in preparation for this service, countless men and women have been serving you. There's been people here, single moms, with kids, cleaning bathrooms. There's been people preparing to lead us in worship, playing instruments, people scheduling volunteers, like making all sorts of things happen on our behalf. Matter of fact, there was a young man here for a couple of days this week. He called and was like, hey, do you mind if I come and do this? And he stood out in the freezing cold for two days with a pressure washer to clean our front entrance. And he did that because he loves Christ. He was responding to what he'd received in the person of Jesus Christ. And you won't know his name, but God does. And God is glorified in the midst of that service. And that sort of thing ought to play itself out hundreds of times over, both in this church and in our community. As we leave here and we go and we offer ourselves to one another. Serve faithfully. If you've been here for a long time in this church and you're not serving somewhere, listen, if you're hurting, you need to be loved and cared for. We get it. There are seasons we want to love and care for you. If you've been here for a while and you never start, just never started serving somewhere, you're just kind of coming and receiving, like my admonition is begin to live as Christ. No longer be selfish, but offer yourself on behalf of other people. There's lots of places that need you. To be honest with you, Every Sunday and every Wednesday, there are kids that walk into this building that are dying for someone to say, I love you. And I love you may mean showing up week after week after week and teaching, leading a small group, watching someone in the nursery. There's kids that just need to know that there is an adult who values them that says you're worth it. It's not the only way you can serve. There's countless ways. Will you give yourself up on behalf of someone else? Will you put aside your selfishness? Right, listen, I get it. Wednesday night might be date night, right? It might be when you go shop for groceries. You might like to sleep in on Sunday mornings. But if we're going to live as Christ, we value sleeping in. We might think, you know what? I'm going to get up early so that someone else can. And we carry that through us, uh, with us throughout our week. The second thing I want to encourage you to do is to begin to give sacrificially. Give sacrificially of your time, and of your finances. The question I often get is kind of the one I started off with. Hey, how much do I, like, how much does the Bible tell me I have to give? 
like, do I have to give, like, a certain percent and all that? And generally, I'll tell people, like, Old Testament, there was a tithe. They brought it to the temple, 10%. Like, that's how it worked. It was actually su- substantially more when it all added up. Um, and so they're like, okay, so it's 10%. And I'm like, no, no it's not. Like, I, I don't know what that particular number is for you in a New Testament setting. Like, there isn't anything that says this is what God requires if you're going to be a good Christian. I would point you to what Jesus Christ gave up for you. We give to others as Christ has given to us. To be honest with you, 10%, man, that ought to be the the very lowest floor and not our ceiling. Jesus gave everything on our behalf. When we say give sacrificially, that means you feel it. That means it costs you something. But here's the thing. It's worth it because Jesus has given to us even more. This is the lifestyle where we serve one another, we give to one another, we say no to ourselves in order to offer things to other people, where we begin to have that mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ, his way of thinking, his way of loving, pursuing his ends instead of our own. And here's what we know. That is fullness of joy. That is the abundant life. That is the life that God is going to exalt and encourage us again, conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel that we have received, taking on the mind and the love and the purpose of Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, we can't say enough about what you've done for us. Lord, my tendency, my default is to think more of myself than I ought to to think I I deserve a certain respect from other people, a certain treatment, and yet I look at how you were treated, and you are greater than I. So, Lord, may we as a people humble ourselves, see ourselves as bond servants. As we go out in the light and the darkness, it's not to be served, it's not to be noticed, but it is truly just worship to you. Father, may this church live as Christ. May you be glorified in us. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.